So uh, what are we talking about tonight, Mr. Aaron? We're talking about Star Trek collectibles from way back when. Is that right? Yep. So we're talking about basically Star Trek before the movies. And one of the interesting things about Star Trek, it wasn't as popular in the toy shops when it was actually on first time round, but when it gathered a kind of following in syndication, that's when it really took off. So Paramount must have, you know, been spewing where they see they cancel this show and then it gets bigger after it's been cancelled on, on different networks. So, yeah, we're, we're going to the, uh, the model kits and it's very interesting with Star Trek model kits. The model kits were out before the show. And uh, this is really interesting for a show like Star Trek because you would think without the show on television, who's going to buy these weird kits, especially, you know, spaceships that haven't been seen before. But the whole thing uh, with the space race meant science fiction was sort of on topic and big. But the reason this happened was, was because... Um, uh, the the model yes, makers yes. they yep. actually helped on the pre production of the show with um, making some of the ships, making some of the model kits and stuff like that. So they were given the inside uh, edge, and they were given um, the rights, and they produced all this stuff, Star Trek merchandise. About three months before the show debuted, you could go and buy some of the model kits in in the in the stores, and this is the one everybody wanted. This was the original um, USS Enterprise model kit. And this kit was so good, they actually used it in a couple of episodes. It was used in, I think, the Doomsday Machine. And whenever they'd show a damaged Enterprise or, or another ship that wasn't the Enterprise, sometimes they'd get this kit off the shelf, whack it together, and it was good enough to be screen accurate. Now, I didn't have that kit, but the one with the three ships in the top right-hand corner there, I actually had um, as a kid growing up, and they were sort of snapped together and then put the stickers on. Down the bottom there, you've got the decal um, sheets for different versions of this kit because it was so successful, it was re-released for many, many years. And when it started off, it just had the um, the USS Enterprise uh, decals, but then they gave you a whole lot of different decals. So you could customize it and make some of the other um, ships that they mentioned or you saw in the series, which is pretty cool. And it's also a good way to get model uh, the, the toy companies to get model makers to buy the kit again. Well, the other the other big thing that Star Trek's probably known for, some of the early merchandise, was the Mego action figures. And there's the stories where Mego snubbed their nose at Star Wars because it wasn't going to be popular, but they, they kept going for other franchises that weren't quite as big. And Star Trek was one of them. Now, Star Trek was actually popular for Mego enough that they released many waves of it. The original... Um, the original action figures were available all through the 70s. Um, this is really interesting because there's quite a bit of advertising from the time for the Mego stuff. There's some Toy Fair catalogs letting retailers know what's coming out. And then there's comic book pages and there's even a Toys R Us uh, catalog with Mr. Spock back in the day telling you which um, Mego figures you could get. And I never really thought of Star Trek as a franchise that was pushed that hard, I guess because it was uh, on in the 60s and then repeated in the 70s. And you don't really get a lot of lines that take off for repeat shows. So I was surprised to see how popular it was um, at the time with, um, you know, in comic books and things like that. This was the first wave of figures, which was Kirk and Spock and... Um, and Bones, and then a Klingon and Scotty and Uhura, which is quite a nice uh, opening set. And then you've got the fantastic Enterprise Bridge play set, which folded up into like a carry case, um, had a transporter in it where you could um, put the figures in, spin it, and they disappeared and bring them back again. And then what I really like is the view screen in the Enterprise had different cardboard cutouts of different alien planets and aliens. So you could take one out and pop another one in and have hours of play with um, who they were contacting and what they were looking at. Here we go when they sort of expanded the line. There's a there's the box for the uh, USS Enterprise playset, and then another picture of the play of the playset that's kind of now been invaded by aliens from the toy line and a couple of the other um, the toys that were advertised in one of the catalogs. One of the things that Star Wars figures didn't have that Mego figures have is that larger artic articulation, so you can pose. Um, Kirk there is obviously about to do his classic double-handed um, karate chop that you see in a few few episodes. And it's very colourful and 
I think it would appeal to adults who like Star Trek, but it's also very toy centric because it's got colors that weren't originally on the bridge. So it, it catches kids attention. And this is the, we're talking about high value items, the original line of Star Trek aliens, um, particularly the ones on the bottom line, they're very, very hard to get. All of the aliens are hard to get um, carded. It's interesting though, because with Star Trek, they sort of got the aliens close, but none of them were ever really spot on. The Klingon was pretty good. Um, the Neptunian up in the top corner they never was never from a Star Trek episode because Mego, like a lot of um, toy brands, used to like to mix and match with what they already had. So if they could keep something as, clo as close to the original mould and then whack new clothes on it, they would just because of production value. But I like the Cheron, like the black and white Cheron is mm. quite a striking action figure, I think. Do you think they really sat and thought about which version do they make? Do they make it with the black on the right side or the black on the left side? Do you know what they would do now? they do 90% the black on the left and 10% black on the white, right and say it's a variant and then collectors would be running around like trying to find, find both. And talking about expensive, this is a super expensive playset. This is Mission to Gamma 5, um, which is, you can't really see how big it is there, but if you look down the bottom um, of the box, you can see Mr. Spock is sort of in in a kid's hand. That's a hand puppet that goes through the, the playset, so you can you can grab him and feed him to the, um, to the monster. And how it also doing? came, <laughs> what's really interesting is it came with, with three figures and I'd have felt ripped off as a kid because you get them home and they're these tiny little figures. They're not Mego size uh, figures at all. Um, I've seen a couple of these because I, I wouldn't mind one of these. I, I've, I've watched them go in auction. And usually they go for over about two and a half thousand Australian and then postage is pretty expensive to get something so big over here. I, I This is one of the few um, Star Trek toys I've only seen pictures of. I've never seen one of these in person. I, I'm wondering if any any of the guys watching into Star Trek have actually got one because they are a super rare uh, toy to get. And then you were asking, was it from an episode? Is this what it was meant to be based on? No, so I, I, there's an episode called, I think it's The Apple, and yes. they used to um, feed feed people into this this mouth. It is very, very loosely based on that. Um, like not at all. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the red guy that came with the set looks like one of the red guys. <laughs> okay, we move on from toys to um, comic books. And comic books are, I particularly love. I actually had a lot of the Star Trek comic books growing up. I never bought them when they were new. I always found them in uh, comic book shops or secondhand shops and would always pick them up and, and read them. Um, they, you could say they, they were were totally different from the Star Trek series. Um, often you'd get the house style, particularly of Golden Key, which we got as Golden Wonder over here, and they were reprinted under different things. And what you'd notice with Marvel and DC, they wrote one way, but Golden Key, they did the Lost in Space and Space Family Robinson and some of those. They must have had house artists and house writers because the stories were invariably totally different um, from the show. And when I say that, they tried tried to use the type of stories that might be in the show, but it was very Golden Key comic book universe, which um, is quite interesting, quite surreal and trippy. Some of them, a lot of them involve running into giant god creatures because um, that happens sometimes. And then the thing with comics, um, they let the comic book artist go wild with the creatures and where you'd get a lot of accurate um, character design, the monsters were almost uh, always like uh, pretty subpar. Um, these are some of the other comic books. I, I've put a, a, a graded one there. I have always found the Star Trek comic hard to get in good condition. Um, you'd find them in collections and they'd always be really well thumbed through. Um, and they do go for quite a high price when they're graded. Um, the, the common issues, like the just the standard run, you can still pick up a big run for a reasonable price. And I do think, you know, stuff from the 60s and 70s is slowly going to dry up. So if you got a couple of these collections, they'd probably be quite a good investment. They were so popular that they did them as enterprise logs where they reprinted them as um, graphic novels. So, you know, they'd put like 10 issues in one sort of thicker book back in the 70s. So they must be one of the few or one of the earlier shows to have that done because I can't remember many other long-running um, comic books that started doing graphic novels that early. Um, so it was popular. And, you know, I do remember seeing reprints of that in Australia for quite a long time.
they did quite a long run of Star Trek comics in the UK. And you can see from the artwork straight away, um, especially for those of us that are into Doctor Who, it has a totally different style. And you can look at that artwork and you say, that's British artwork. Um, the layout is different. The colour is different. I think it's actually, you know, nicer presented. And these are quite collectible. There's a lot of um, a lot of collectors that try and trace down particularly the, the colour editions of um, the British TV comics. And I guess they would be so rare and unusual in America because back in the day you didn't really import the British comics back to the, the US. There are collections of these that have done really well. I think there's three volumes where they've taken the TV21 and the TV comics and they've put them into... Um, collections and sold them and they're they're really lovely artwork and some of that's quite quite stunning star trek also got a run of british annuals and again this is unusual because it was an american show and a lot of american shows didn't get british annuals or if they did they were sort of one off for one year because they didn't do amazingly well but the star trek um annuals ran for 10 years and none of the years they were available were when Star Trek was actually being made. The first one, I think, is a 1969 annual, so it would have been the one for 1970 because kids used to get them for Christmas the year before. And the thing that interests me, I always thought it was Kirk, Spock and McCoy. But when you look at the 60s and 70s merchandise, it is just Kirk and Spock. Um, so you really could see that they were the two main characters. And now I think with hindsight where everyone has favourites and sort of different characters have come to the fore, it's, it's, it's more of a balanced thing. But back when Star Trek was originally being pushed, Captain Kirk was the lead man that got like most of the um most of the covers and most of the art and then mr spock was the fan favorite that, that got the other half of the the attention um and and this is something you see right up until sort of i guess the star trek movies that we'll be looking at at a different time um i love the kirk up here can we come a piece shoot to kill he's brought his big ass gun <laughs> shooting <laughs> shit out of something so uh and i know it's like the font that hasn't followed anything like the like the traditional star trek font at all for the titling but, uh, yeah, I didn't realise there was one for each year, but, uh, yeah, it's very groovy. And, and it's interesting. They kept, even though it wasn't the Star Trek font, they kept it for the whole mm. run of the show. So at least collectors couldn't whinge about the spines looking different. Now, these are some of my earliest recollect recollections of the Star Trek episodes because I was kind of, I grew up in that era where I do remember them and watch them a bit, but they weren't being repeated to death and there were no videos at the time. So I remember the, um, the photo novels uh, and these were great and they were all colour all the way through and they were basically pictures of every scene of every episode put into comic book form. And so they're like a photo comic. And there are a few others. Um, I've got the Close Encounters one and there's a few other movies that have had them. But there, I can't think of another series that have had so many photo novels because um, we've talked about this before. Before the days of the internet, there weren't a lot of pictures um, that you could access of your favourite show. So you could get Starlog magazine or Starburst. And, but these I remember as pretty unique as a visual record of an entire episode of something. And so these were pretty amazing. And I remember um, they had quite tight spines. And I remember my original ones, the pictures, the, the pages falling out because I'd opened them because I wanted to see the whole, the whole picture. Down the bottom left there, we've got a couple of the interior pictures, which were full page pictures of character reactions and then enough of the other scenes to move the story along with bubble dialogue like in comics and then explanations of what's going on to fill in the rest of the story. Now we did did a show on board games before but Star Trek did get a couple of board games. Um, we looked at the one that was sold earlier on eBay. Uh, and th there was a couple of others that were released during the time, and they, they were pretty popular. Um, the Star Trek games, I don't think I've ever had any of them or played any of them, but I do like how each of them has a different style and um, a very colourful and striking artwork. And then there's the, the animated game, which sort of crept in. The animated stuff is in this era as well and sort of before the, before the movies and before, like, all the Star Trek lore was set. So... Um, you've got two games from the original series and the animated game, and each of them are totally different games. And we're moving on now to Star Trek um, Jigsaws. Uh, <laughs> Jigsaws were one of those things that every um, 
popular franchise got because every kid loves putting together jigsaws and jigsaw companies know that the entire family will sit down and do a jigsaw together or on a rainy day the grandparents will say let's get out a jigsaw and play it so star trek had a couple of um really nice uh jigsaw sets usually with jigsaws you'll get about four to a set all of them are usually done by the same artist so they sort of look like a set and they all came out in different years so you could probably collect a set one year then a couple of years later a different set comes out um, and they were for different ages some of them are more uh, less pieces and sort of more colorful and then some of them are a bit more challenging this is another set um, the the bottom ones are sort of maybe more aimed at uh, kids the top ones though were some of the uh, photographic uh, jigsaws that were nice if you wanted to collect you know photos from the series the photo ones i found actually quite hard to find i think there's probably more to the set than i could find because usually they were in sets of four and, and the thing with the star trek stuff um it was much more of a search to find everything there aren't as many websites that document it and there aren't as many images online so um, a lot of this stuff I hadn't seen myself. I've, I've had Star Trek jigsaws, but I didn't know there were so many sets and I didn't know the pictures that were on them. So it's some very cool stuff. It's one of the rare occasions you get to see the crew, um, which is kind of groovy. So, uh, yes, that's the you don't see much of the background characters at all in, in a lot of the things that we've well, seen so far. Nurse Chapel being included is quite mm. rare. And then um, th th this is another set. And again, the Whitman jigsaws were more for, for younger kids. They're colourful and um, sort of easy to do. Um, I do remember there's that tin there with the Star Trek um, crew on. I did not know they made a Star Trek tin uh, with a jigsaw in. And up the top there, that kind of fits into puzzles, is a Star Trek slide, uh, you know, slide puzzle where you can um, mix up the... The, the sort of bad black and white image of Captain Kirk and then reassemble him. Um, and if you mix it up enough, it looks like a transporter accident. And the la last lot of jigsaws um, that, that I found, this was um, another set that had, again, a totally different style of artwork um, with cool pictures. Again, they were done by Whitman's, who did, did quite a few different uh, sets of jigsaws. I'm looking at the middle picture, right? Yep. So McCoy, he's got the tricorder. Spock, he's got the communicator, that's right. And what's Kirk's got the friggin' gun. So come in peace, shoot to kill. <laughs> I've written all over it. <laughs> yeah, we've got another one of the slide puzzles down in the left. And on the other side was um, a Star Trek mega crossword puzzle, which actually was like a, a fold-out thing. You got out of a box and folded it out, and there was the, the crossword puzzle with all the clues in the shape of an Enterprise, which I tell you what, would probably be quite rare to find an un unfilled in one because the first thing you do with something like that is do all the questions you know and then go bugger this, the rest are too hard, and throw it in the back of the cupboard. One of my favourite ever Star Trek toys is the USS Enterprise Dinky Toy. Um, there's a couple of ads for it on the left there. Now, Dinky Toys were a British metal die-cast toy company that uh, did a lot of um, space and, and genre shows, more than um, a lot of other other companies. Uh, I guess Corgi Toys did some stuff as well. But this was very cool because it would actually fire out the disc photon torpedoes. You loaded them in the top and then you... Uh, there's a little metal trigger on the top of the bridge and you sw swing it around and it flicks them out and it, they come out quite powerfully. So you could have a battle with your, your Klingon um, nemesis. But uh, the other thing that's interesting about this, the, the docking bay opens up underneath uh, the bottom of the ship and you can actually get a shuttlecraft that comes out. And that is a really hard piece to find because it's always missing. Finding one in nice white condition is pretty hard, but find a complete one with all the discs and the shuttle bay. Um, you can get them because they were mass produced, but it's pretty expensive. Like a lot of dinky toy stuff, you can buy reproductions of the, the firing parts and the shuttle. Now, some people out there may have watched the show, uh, The Toys That Made Us, and there's a big Star Trek episode relating to that. Uh, they omit this line completely they don't make no reference to the dinky enterprise because i think it was an american show focusing on american collectibles so if you wanted to watch a bit more of the history as to where this ship came from and how dinky got involved don't bother watching it because i don't mention it at all which is uh very disappointing so it is, a shame there you go. It is one of the best toys for the yep. original series yeah yep so here here is the um the klingon counterpart to the 
the Enterprise. And again, it, it, it had the firing discs. It's a very heavy toy. You can get it, um, you could get both of these toys for quite a while. They were so popular, they were in production for a long time. Uh, the original ones were in the solid boxes with the artwork on the cover. And then they had the window display boxes uh, where you could see the toy inside. And then in the bottom left, I've never had that version, which has a double pack of both the toys together, which would have been super cool. That would have been something I'd have loved to have got when I was growing up. Yeah, they didn't exactly package them very well, did they? Sort of just jammed them in there together and said, <laughs> oh, yeah, that'll do. So we go from beautiful looking toys to um, cereal edible um, edible collectibles. And these are sugar, uh, sugar smack um cereal from the UK and Sugar Smack really did franchise a lot of stuff. There's Star Wars masks and Doctor Who masks and, you know, there's Doctor Doolittle and all these different things. The Star Trek ones are particularly hard to get. They are so hard to get that I could find the, um, the Mr. Spock and the Sulu masks that are there. I couldn't even find the other examples online. Not even people had them in their collection. So there's a packet there that shows um, what you could what, what masks you could get and the Star Trek promotion was so popular it ran for three promotions so for the first part you could get badges and there's a set of the badges down the bottom and then you could get cut out masks so you could look like your favorite Star Trek character and then I'd have felt a bit ripped off if I hadn't got all the Star Trek stuff I wanted because then they went with NASA space mission pads and patches so you could get NASA patches that you could sew onto your um, to your bomber jacket or wherever you wanted to stuff them. Now, anyone who's into Star Trek knows Star Trek is legendary for the music. I mean, two of the greatest unsung pop heroes of our generation are Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner. But we're, we're not looking at them at the moment. We're looking at Star Trek-related um, uh, records. And there have been different ones over the, over the period of the show. The early ones were Star Trek stories. Um, read for kids to listen to or um, effects albums. Uh, there wasn't a lot at the time of Star Trek music. There was the theme and there might have been one soundtrack album, but most of, most of them were more related to sort of the kids' albums where you would follow along with the book or follow along with the comic as you heard a, a Star Trek story. I've never actually listened to any of these and I couldn't even find an example of one to listen to online, but I'm sure they're out there if you wanted to download them or find them. So when you read along with the story, the thing will say at the start, the narrator will say, you turn the page whenever Kirk shoots someone. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, every time you hear a red shirt scream and die, change the turn the page. <laughs> yeah, love it. So up in the top there as well, this is, is a modern item, but it's actually a Star Trek Enterprise turntable. Um, so if you were going to get some vintage albums, you could track down the turntable and listen to it on your Star Trek Enterprise uh, high fidelity turntable. And these are the, these are the ones I actually remembered and had. Um, they were the, the mini albums that were long play and they had the comic books that you followed around as you listened to the album. Uh, these are really nice and really collectible. And like a lot of kids' albums, they're hard to get in good condition because kids do the thing where they want to put the record on the player themselves and put the needle down. And by the time they've done that, a new album is like totally trashed on the first first play. Um, but I like the comics that come with them and I like the, the the stories and I even like the label that have the the Star Trek characters on and that. And that's the top of the uh, Enterprise record player. Mm. It has three speeds. It has 45, 33 and warp factor six. <laughs> the Star Trek Viewmasters are another very cool item. I had, um, I had some of the individual Viewmasters. I didn't have the big tin. Um, that's quite a, quite a rare and desirable item. A lot of people after that, you can see... Um, on the top left, you've got the advert for the Viewmasters. Um, down the bottom, it doesn't really translate so well. Someone online had taken pictures of the slides from the Viewmaster and put high definition pictures up. And they really, really looked um, quite good. And I was reading an article somewhere and some of these uh, ships in the pictures were from the models that we saw right at the beginning. Um, so there was a few different stories. I think there was the animated ones and then there was also where you've got the model model ones as well. So there was ones from the animated series and ones from Star Trek. Um, so they're quite cool items. Viewmasters are one of those things that often gets um, forgotten, but I think everybody growing up had a Viewmaster at some time. And here's one of the really early Star Trek collectibles. Um, the original... Uh, 
leaf edition of Star Trek collector cards. So again, I have never seen locally in Australia, so I'm pretty sure they weren't sold here, um, but they could have been. Uh, the black and white set of Star Trek trading cards. And again, I was looking at these and boy, unless you were Kirk or Spock, you really got sidelined. <laughs> There's one with Janice Rand there and a couple of others, but it was really the Kirk and Spock show. Here is uh, the ones I remember growing up with. These were released in the 70s. These are the um, Star Trek collector cards, the colour ones. There are Scanlan's versions of this as well as Tops. So the Tops ones were released in America with the stickers and the Scanlan's ones were released in Australia and they didn't have um, the stickers with them. The Scanlan's ones I actually like a bit better because they seem to be on more bleached paper so the colours stand out more. The backs are totally different as well because of that. <laughs> the cards really conveyed a lot of excitement and actually wanted me, made me want to watch the show more when um, it wasn't available on, on video. We're getting to the end of our presentation. This was just a wrap up of other stuff that was around and that was available. And you've got the Star Trek um, Marble Maze, which interestingly is exactly the same Marble Maze as the Doctor Who one we looked at. It's just got a different picture on the back of it that the, the actual um, formed plastic part is exactly the same. The Star Trek pop up book, which I had um, growing up, uh, a phaser targeting set, which is very, very cool. Uh, there was a lot of phaser targeting and communicators and things like that. That um, really weird red, white and blue Enterprise is a vintage piece that I just saw on eBay at the moment. I thought that's a really unusual Enterprise. Down the bottom, there's some more um, things you can fire. So there's the Star Trek um, jet disc, which basically, you know, again, try and gouge your, your friend's eyes out. And then there's <laughs> like, there's a phaser thing, but again, it's like you put these discs on and rip them as hard as you can and they fly off into the sky. Um, a tricorder. And then uh, they're kind of split up, but on the left is the, the thermos and on uh, next to the tricorder there is the actual lunchbox. So if you wanted to be the coolest kid in school, you could have your, your, you drink your Star Trek soup and eat your sandwiches out of your Star Trek lunchbox. And then there was another picture of the models um, down down the corner there that we've already so looked at. You go to school with your lunchbox, you open up your lunch thinking you're the coolest kid in town, the local bully comes along, takes your lunch out and says, look at that, it's just been beamed up. <laughs> Now here we go. This is this is what you call blatant um, blatant company gouging. Uh, this toy line already existed. It was like a space invasion line. Star Trek came along and got popular, so they rebranded just about everything they had with pictures of Mister Spock and Captain Kirk, and just called it like the Star Trek space helmet or the Star Trek communicator. When nothing at all resembled anything that was on the show. Can you imagine if you were a kid and you're like, tell your parents, I want Star Trek for my birthday, I want Star Trek for Christmas, and they give you this goober helmet with two big big eyes on it. It looks like a monster that was in um, Space 1999, actually. Nothing from so, Star so, Trek. So when the kid is crying his eyes out going, this is complete shit, why have you got me this? And the parents say, oh, it's in a deleted scene, don't worry about it. <laughs> Look at Captain Kirk in that helmet. That does not make him a cooler captain. And look at Mr. Spock in that helmet. He is not a cooler Vulcan because he's hiding his ears in that helmet. If you wanted to attract a bully to beat you up, if you wore that around the neighbourhood, it's like a siren, isn't it? Like, um, that would that would do it. Uh, I, I do think as toy collectors now, they're absolutely fantastic and I would love them. As a kid back in the day... That would have been the type of thing I would have opened and, you know, been really disappointed. <laughs> no, I, I disagree. I reckon you would have stuck that on. Like the kid in the bottom left-hand corner here, right, gone, where's my local Comic Con? I'm going to go along and I'll tell you what, the chicks, I'm going to be beating them off with sticks. <laughs> yes. So there was the the Astro Train, the Astro Tank, and they just put Star Trek in front of it. Um, you've got a Frisbee, which is, like, changed into the Star Trek space disc and um, the buzz ray gun which resembles nothing like anything from even the aliens used in star trek so this was uh really blatant and we looked last week where doctor who did it but at least they tried to fit the products in with the show where this is like 99 percent nothing to do with the show and we'll whack captain kirk or spock on the cover and call it star trek that's what the Star Trek helmet was adapted from, but we've got some really average um, uh, dress ups where you've got, you know, 
would a Klingon really be seen dead in the Klingon <laughs> um, Halloween costume? And, you know, the Mr. Spock's there. Why couldn't they just do a nice Mr. Spock blue blue tunic rather than, um, you, you know, Mr. Spock did not walk around with an action pose of Mr. Spock on his top kind of thing. <laughs> um, regarding the Klingon outfit, you know, if the kid starts to complain, and, mate, that looks, ma, that looks completely wussy, go, hey, it's a warrior's costume, so just deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the end of our Star Trek presentation for the well. night.